Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the 29th Seoul IPRC Lecture Series. <coughs> Thank you for attending today's event. Uh, I'm Young Sok Lee, uh, Secretary General of the Seoul IPRC and <coughs> President of the Korean Council for in International Arbitration, Korea. <coughs> and today's event is hosted and co-hosted by Seoul IPRC, OCR and also commercial, uh, Korean Commercial Arbitration Board, uh, which is the arbitration institution in Korea. I would like to express my gratitude to the KCAB uh, and COSIA uh, for co-hosting today's lecture along with the uh, Seoul IDRC. As you know very well, uh, Seoul IDRC is a hearing facility dedicated to international arbitration. <coughs> Seoul IDRC has been hosting various seminars and lectures as well to promote international arbitration in Korea. Because Seoul IDRC Lecture Series is one of the key, key events where we introduce leading arbitration, international arbitration practitioners in Korea to the Korean arbitration community. Today, I have the honor of introducing uh, Justice Quentin Law Judge of the Supreme Court of Singapore and Judge in Charge of the Singapore International Commercial Court. Uh, Justice Law, uh, uh, before he joined the bench, he was the deputy managing partner of Raja and Tan LLP, which is uh, one of the very major uh, law firms in Singapore, and a key member of, the, of its international arbitration group until his appointment as a Judicial Commissioner in 2009. He was also Director of uh, the famous Maxwell Chambers. Uh, and in 2010, he was appointed as a Judge of the Supreme Court. Today, uh, he, will, he will be talking about the art of dispute resolution in an interconnected world and uh, he will uh, specifically uh, introduce uh, Seoul, uh, Singapore International Commercial Court, uh, which some of you may already know very well, but uh, to some of you, uh, somewhat unfamiliar. And we will have the honor of learning about uh, SICC, Singapore International Commercial Court, from him. And, uh, I will not spend more time in introducing him. Um, we will now begin Seoul IDRC 29th lecture series. Please join me in welcoming uh, him with big, big hands. I must thank BC and the Seoul IDRC for this kind invitation to come and share some ideas about international dispute resolution with you. And this is done in the context of international trade and commerce. I also bring news of some exciting initiatives that are taking place in the world amongst the commercial courts. And in talking about dispute resolution in an international context, I think I would be speaking, preaching to the converted if I have to go through and convince you that many of the large international commercial contracts today involve more than two jurisdictions. Just think of a rail, high-speed rail project. Just think of a gas pipeline with LNG and terminal. Think of the number of countries and the different legal jurisdictions you would come through. But as we all know, no businessman likes to be dragged before the court of his contract counterparty, find himself before a foreign court, a foreign legal system, and have to be represented by lawyers he's not familiar with. And as you all know, what happened was they turned to arbitration. The solution was international arbitration. So with the tremendous growth of international trade and commerce over the last 20 years, so did international arbitration grow in tandem and in sophistication. I'm sure many of you are well aware of the 
the 2015 International Arbitration Survey by the Queen Mary University of London, where 90% of the respondents, even though that was four years ago, 90% of them said arbitration was their preferred resolution mechanism. Only 4% preferred cross-border litigation. So today, most countries with a significant international trade and services component of their GNP will have their own international arbitration centre, its own rules and their own statutes governing international arbitration. And often, when one international arbitration centre makes an improvement, very shortly thereafter, the other arbitral institutions follow suit. A good example is the emergency arbitrator provision. Now you'll find most in international arbitral institutions in different countries have that provision. Well, we find that with more maturity and experience, businessmen and lawyers realize that international arbitration is not the only way to go. There were other and better methods depending on your dispute. Mediation has all the benefits where the parties still have to continue to do business with one another. And so that took root. And now other forms of ADR, like mediation, binding neutral evaluation, have all given rise to mediators and arbitrators who practice internationally. So once these vistas opened up, i.e. international arbitration is not the only way to go. You will find that single track solutions are no longer the norm. So many countries now have met up, up met up hybrids. The centers learn from one another. In Singapore, we have the Singapore International Mediation Center. It has partnered other mediation centers and they learn from each other. So let me show you what we have today in Singapore. And disputes arose and the government did not renew the trust. So the trust expired. So Dala had this dispute and it had these huge sums owing to them. And they started arbitration in Paris. There was an arbitration clause no governing law, but seat was ICC Paris. So they started the arbitration against the government of Pakistan because the trust had disappeared. It had not been renewed by statute. So the government of Pakistan took out an application before the tribunal to say, I am not a party to that arbitration agreement. And that tribunal, including Lord Mustill, the famous English judge, ruled they were. And he went on to make a second award against them. So Dala goes across to England to try and enforce it. And the government of Pakistan says, again, I am not a party to that agreement. It was the trust. So I cannot be liable and I shouldn't be paid this award. That challenge went up to the Court of Appeal and the House of Lords in England. And the English court agreed with the government of Pakistan that they were not a party. So Dalla Real Estate could not enforce its award in England. But in the same time, there were parallel proceedings in Paris. So, in Paris, Dala went before the Curial Court, the supervisory court of the seat. And they went up to the Paris Court of Appeal, and the Paris Court of Appeal held they were the party to the arbitral agreement. So, it's a wonderful situation, isn't it? And one wonders what would have happened if, instead of the English proceedings going first, the French proceedings had concluded earlier. And the Paris court had said the government of Pakistan was a party to the agreement. What would the English court have done? 
So what is the lesson we learn from that? 10 to 12 years after they started the arbitration, Dala was still chasing after enforcement in England and in France. If you are a businessman, would you be happy? You'd be very, very upset. You would have spent a lot of money on legal fees and you've got nowhere. Now, if it had been reversed, that means the English court had said to the government of Pakistan, you are a party. And the French court had said, they are not a party. And set aside the award at the seat. Again, you could have a problem enforcing that agreement. I think I can be forgiven if I say half the arbitrating world will say that an award that is set aside at the seat cannot be enforced anywhere. And the other half, many of them are the civil law countries, would say it doesn't matter. The award still exists. In the famous words of some of the leading arbitrators, they say it floats above the national system and therefore I can enforce it. So, you have these problems. You also have uh, cases even in Singapore where they've gone to Singapore, problems with enforcement, they've gone to Hong Kong, problems with enforcement, and that's the PT First Media TBK case against Astro, Yusantara. Well, that's one kind of problem that you have. For more than 15 to 20 years, I've heard ever-increasing rumblings against the delays, the cost of resolving disputes by arbitration, I've heard this both as a practitioner, where of course I did nothing about it except to secure my fees, and as a judge. And I see it in a different light now. But I was struck how strongly in a conference five years ago, the users of arbitration, which included construction companies and other companies, were complaining at this conference openly about the costs and delays in arbitration. And these are the complaints of the users. Now these complaints are not anecdotal. They are in journals, they are in articles, and they are in the, uh, uh, some of the cases. The judges have said, this is terrible, this has gone on for years and the party has got nowhere. So you won't be surprised if I say in a 2015 international arbitration survey, they say the worst features of arbitration are cost, 68%. Lack of effective sanctions during the arbitral process, 46%. That means one party keeps delaying and the arbitrators cannot give a peremptory order. Lack of insight into arbitrators' efficiency, 39%. Lack of speed, 36% all in that order. Secondly, arbitration is now seen as a one-shot affair. That means you have only one chance to win. So enormous resources go into arbitration. The smallest issues are fought over and enormous costs are built up because you have only one shot at winning or defending something successfully. So, you have a problem because if you feel it's wrong, there's no appeal. And there are equally serious complaints. Forgive me if those of you who are arbitrators in this room. Equally serious complaints have risen over the possible lack of independence when arbitrators and counsel are drawn from the same small pool. There are question marks over them. So these rumblings and shortcomings of arbitration we find in the international arena have sparked a re-interest in the commercial courts like London. It would surprise many of you to know today that only 28% of English commercial court users in 2016-2017 are English. This is from a survey. The survey company uh, called Portland Communications, I believe, 
went through all the case reported cases and the case file notes to pick out how many cases were foreign and how many had local litigants. So only 28% had two English litigants. In 2012, before our Chief Justice Sundaresh Bennett took office, he visited the English commercial courts and then he found this out. 70 to 75 percent of their cases involved one foreign party. 40 percent of their cases involved two foreign parties and they had nothing to do with England. So the English Chief Justice shared his experiences as why this was so and said to Chief, our Chief Justice to be he was surprised Singapore hadn't started an international commercial court because the Singapore judiciary shared many characteristics of the English courts and judiciary. What are these? You have well respected and impartial judges, judges who are, are incorruptible, judges who are very knowledgeable and well versed in commercial matters, and judges who have had thriving commercial practices before they went up on the bench. In other words, they understood commerce. So this led to the establishment of the Singapore International Commercial Court in January 2015. And Singapore is not unique, by the way. The English Commercial Court was set up in 1895. The Delaware Court of Chancery is another commercial court. Delaware, as you know, is the home of the Fortune 500 companies. The Commercial Court of the Supreme Court of Victoria then the Dubai International Financial Center called DIFC. Those came before SICC. So, if you go to the SICC and ask, what is it? If you look at this slide, it is a court for cross-border commercial disputes, including those governed by English, sorry, governed by foreign law. It's a court for foreign parties, particularly those in Asia, and it can be anywhere else in the world, a court for parties who prefer to have their disputes resolved in court. So what is this SICC? It is a court that addresses some of the shortcomings of international arbitration, while providing benefits that are usually associated with international arbitration. We use a dispute resolution framework that is internationally accepted. It applies substantive principles of international law and commercial law and implements international best practices. So what is some what are some of the unique features? First and foremost, it is a division of the Singapore Court. What does that mean? That means Singapore Supreme Court has got three components. A High Court for national and domestic, the SICC for international and commercial cases, and a Court of Appeal. So, what are your jurisdictional requirements? The SICC hears claims that are international and commercial in nature. Parties submit to the jurisdiction under written jurisdiction agreements very much like your arbitration clauses. If you visit our website, which I will come to later, you will find these model clauses there. And so long as the parties are not seeking relief against a state or sovereign of a state, or any prerogative orders. I don't know if you have this in Korea. These are certiorari mandamus, that means quashing order, prohibitory orders, habeas corpus. We don't deal with that in the commercial court. And you have a right of appeal. Unless the parties agree, and you can agree, that there's no appeal under our jurisdiction clause. So what is the definition of international? So one characteristic, the parties have places of business in different states. Or none of the parties have places of business in Singapore. Or at least one party has its place of business outside the state in which a substantial part of the obligation is to be performed or with which the subject matter of the dispute is 
most closely connected, or parties agree that the subject matter of the claim relates to more than one state. What is commercial? Any matter that arises from a relationship of a commercial nature, contractual or not, so it can include tort. It includes in persona intellectual property disputes, and the parties can agree by the clause that they deem any dispute arising out of this as commercial. So it gives jurisdiction. And if you look at the rules of our court, they will expand on this, like the supply and exchange of goods and services, distribution agreements, commercial representation or agency, factoring, leasing, construction work, consultant, engineering or licensing work, investment, financing, banking, insurance, exploitation, and it goes on and on. So you get the flavor as to what's commercial. And I don't know if many of you realize what arbitration has resulted in. These awards are confidential, so they are not published. What goes on in an arbitration room is confidential. No one sees. So the net result is you don't have the growth of a body of awards. There's no growth of jurisprudence. So how do you develop the Lex Mercatoria, the law of the agent, merchant, the law of the merchant, in an international context? In the Dalla case, I mentioned that Lord Mustill was the chairman of the tribunal. He is a champion of Lex Mercatoria. Lex Mercatoria doesn't fall within any country. And perhaps I can read to you in the award what uh, the, the three, the tribunal said. What is their law merchant? They consist of those transnational general principles which the arbitrators would consider to meet the fundamental requirements of justice in international trade. Now, if you think of all the elements of that statement and you don't have published awards, how do you advise your clients? Or how do you know whether you fall within the fundamental requirements of justice in international trade? There's no jurisprudence because of confidentiality. So, the fact that you come to an international commercial court, there are judgments. You develop the jurisprudence. There's one level of appeal. So the court of appeal develops binding precedents. So what are the key features of the SICC? Why would you come to the SICC? You would come because there's transparency of open proceedings. There's availability of one level of appeal, no more. You avoid party-appointed tribunals and the ability to join third and related parties and you have published judgments. Now, avoiding party-appointed tribunals. Those of you who read up on international uh, commercial arbitration, there was an article and some survey where they say 95% of the dissenting awards are the party appointed arbitrators of the party that lost. What does that tell you? The parties appoint arbitrator, they lose their arbitrator dissents in 95% of the cases. Is that impartiality? I'm not accusing arbitrators of being partial. There's also subconscious partiality. And I think that is something that gives rise to concern. So, let me now go to this. Who are our specialist judges? This panel you see here are the Singapore judges. These are the Supreme Court judges. Um, how do I work this? So you have the Chief Justice who was a top commercial litigator in his time and a top international arbitration litigator. You've got judges who are admiralty and commercial and corporate law specialists, including judges who are 
this, uh, this last one, middle row, rightmost, your side, yes, rightmost. He was a naval architect before he took up law. Next to him is an engineer who took up law after his career in engineering. And he currently leads all our IT initiatives in the court. He's very tuned into technology. And myself, I did complex commercial case, construction, insurance, reinsurance. George Wei, you know there, he's another IP judge. The last judge on the bottom row right is a um, insolvency specialist. Now, what else is special about our SICC? The Chief Justice can appoint any of his local judges to sit in the International Commercial Court. What's different about the SICC, although it's a national court, is this. We have international judges. So it's like your international arbitrators. So let me just point to three people. France, Austria, Japan. They are civil law countries. The Japanese person is Professor Taniguchi and he is the doyen of arbitration in Japan. Ungra Chris was president of one of their courts. She's an IP person. France, we have Dominic Hashian, who maybe it's easier right, than a point. This person is a sitting judge of the French Supreme Court. Caroline Berger was one of the five Supreme Court justices in Delaware. And Delaware, as I said before, is the home of the Fortune 500. Sir Vivian Ramsey. Those of you who do construction will know who he is. He was the top construction silk in UK. And then he was persuaded by the Lord Chancellor to become a judge to raise the profile of the technology and construction court. Bernard Riggs, Bernard Eder, well-known commercial judges, insurance, shipping, commercial law. Simon Tolley, well-known IP. And so we go on. We've got Paddy Bergen. Until last month, she was the chief judge in equity. That's the busiest commercial court in New South Wales. Roger Giles used to be chief judge of the commercial court in New South Wales. Dyson Hayden, High Court of Australia, well-known intellect. And Selma Reyes, former Hong Kong judge. And he looked after the shipping list, the admiralty list, the construction list. And so on. So, the Chief Justice will designate in any one case which judge will preside. Some simple cases, one judge will preside. Sometimes, three judges will preside. We had a case where there were two Japanese parties, each suing the other. They came to Singapore because the bank account was in Singapore. And the Chief Justice appointed a three-judge panel, and one of them was Taneguchi. There was another case that involved the guarantee, the bank, BNP, and French as governing law. One of the judges was the Supreme Court judge from France. So, the correct judge with the correct background and expertise will be matched by the Chief Justice to the case. As I said, you can have one judge, you can have three judges according to your case. If it's one judge and you appeal, it will be three judges on appeal. If it's three judges at first instance, you have five judges on the field. So that's one of the unique features of our court. We have international judges. This list is not closed. As the workload increases, we will appoint other judges. I hope soon or shortly, we will be able to include a Korean judge. And that happens if we have some Korean cases in Singapore at SICC and you feel, the parties feel they would also like a Korean judge to be there. I'm sure in time to come we will also appoint a PRC judge because of the work that comes out. So what is another feature that mixes international arbitration and a national court? We allow foreign representation. 
So if it, if it is an offshore case with nothing to do with Singapore, you can bring in your foreign counsel. Counsel you are comfortable with, counsel who knows your business, and counsel you trust. He can just register and represent your company, the SICC. So, if you look, that is our website, www.sicc.gov.sg. You'll find the requirements, which are fairly straightforward for registration of foreign lawyers. We also have a permanent register where whoever registers goes there. As of 25th August, we had 77 foreign lawyers. In the United Kingdom, we have 37, Australia 10, US 7, Hong Kong 6, India 5, Japan 4, Canada, Philippines, New Zealand, Switzerland, Indonesia, and South Korea. BC's partner. So, we also have flexibility in procedure. What do we mean by that? You don't have to follow the Singapore court procedure in the SICC. You can have modified procedures. So, discovery, we generally follow the IPA rules of reception of evidence. If you want to dis to do so, you can disapply Singapore law, like the Evidence Act on hearsay, our Evidence Act on uh, rule brown, rule in brown and done, putting your case to everybody. So we have flexibility. We have flexibility on evidentiary rules. So you need not feel intimidated by local rules. And if you want, you can ask for confidentiality. And if it's the right kind of case, if both parties want it, it is likely that the court will grant confidentiality. That means nobody can read the court files. Neither party can publish the court proceedings. And if we have to give a judgment, it is anonymized. How do we do that? The names are changed. So the plaintiff's company's name becomes XYZ versus ABC. It's actually, that's what appears in our law reports. We have a lot of that. We change the countries where the project was, the contract details, so that it's anonymous. It's, it's harder to track where, which case you're talking about. We can also apply for confidentiality on a specific part, so the rest of the proceedings may be open. But if you have, for example, evidence on pricing policy, you might want to keep that confidential. I have just recently done that. I sealed the file on the accounts and the confidentiality in relation to pricing, how you made up the prices. Another big difference which you can't get in arbitration, joinder of parties. Now, all you need in Singapore is the two parties to have a jurisdiction agreement to go to the SICC. If you want to join a third party, that third party need not have an exclusive jurisdiction clause. We can bring it in so long as it is clear that there are common issues of fact, common issues of law, and they are clearly connected, and that for the ends of justice you need that third party in. Now, some of you may tell me, yes, but other arbitral institutions have third-party proceedings. But if you examine these third-party proceedings, uh, provisions, you will find that actually they are quite restrictive. Many depend on consent. If there is no consent, you can't do it. If you want to insist to join them without consent, as I think one of the uh, provision, one of the arbitral institutions allow that, I think the Swiss. What will happen is, when you try and enforce the contract, the award debtor will say, I was forced to arbitrate with a party I never agreed to come in and stick his nose into my arbitration. Then you're going to have a problem enforcing that award under the New York Convention. Because the losing party will say, I never agreed to have that third party in. But if you have a court case and you put a third party in, 
If the court issues an order, that's the end of it. There's no more dispute. So, costs in the SICC, by the discretion of the court, generally we allow costs as incurred by the party subject to reasonableness and proportionality. Generally, costs are borne by the unsuccessful party, so again, nothing unusual. Now, I come to another important part, enforcement. So you may ask me, so I get a Singapore judgment, it's a domestic judgment. How do I enforce it? Now, there are three legal bases on which you can enforce it. On the left column, you have enforcement pursuant to bilateral arrangements. That's basis one. Basis two, Hague Convention. Basis three, enforcement by summary proceedings on a common law action for debt. So let me try this work. So if you just go by the reciprocal enforcement of Commonwealth judgments, you see Malaysia and Singapore involved, Brunei, Papua New Guinea, Australia, New Zealand, Windward Island, Sri Lanka, India, Pakistan, UK. So any judgments within these countries can be enforced in the other country with minimum hoops and hurdles to jump over or through. You register your judgment. The party has basically 14 or 21 days to set it aside. If it doesn't, it becomes a judgment. And you can set aside only on very narrow grounds. So this is the full list. Now we have the Hague Conventions. If you add the Hague Convention, it's in orange. 22 countries minus Denmark. Mexico. So I'm just showing you the reach. Now we come to USA. Many countries in the common law, many common law countries, if you have a debt on a, you are a judgment creditor, you can start an action in the common law country as an action on a judgment debt. It's enforced summarily and the judge will normally not allow the party to relitigate this case. We already have a case in the, in the New York case where they enforce the judgment on a judgment on a common law debt. Sorry, a common law action on a debt. Ukraine has signed on the Hague, sorry. No, sorry, this, this slide is US and Ukraine have signed but they have not exceeded or ratified the Hague Convention. So they are not Hague Convention countries yet. We know that, uh, we heard that uh, Australia and China will sign soon on the Hague Convention and I heard Korea would sign soon but I don't know whether that's true or not. That was just hearsay. So, common law action on the debt, you can go to Canada, you can enforce it. USA, we can enforce it. And we also have something called court-to-court -court agreements. So, Singapore has reached out, for example, to the courts of New South Wales, and we signed a memorandum of guidance to enforce each other's judgments. So, it's informal, it's non-binding. But the fact that we've signed the memorandum means that we will enforce each other's judgments unless fraud was involved, no due process was involved, or it's against our public policy. That is very difficult to prove fraud. Our public policy is very narrow. Public policy that will defeat a judgment is very narrow. What do I mean? In Singapore, it is we have a law that says wagering contracts are non-enforceable, gambling debts. But we have enforced a judgment obtained in a foreign jurisdiction on a gambling debt. It is not against our public policy to enforce that. So we have court-to-court -court agreements. You can add on those countries with Dubai, DIFC, Ukraine, Abu Dhabi, Australia, New Zealand. Some of them are replicated. So, now I come to another part. After we look and did research on common law countries, we look at civil law countries. 
we were surprised to find that civil law countries also enforce judgment debts from another country and do not give the parties lateral great latitude to set it aside or not enforce it. In Japan, there was a case in Singapore where judgment was obtained against a director for breach of fiduciary duties and it was a judgment by default. He failed to defend it. So it wasn't a full hearing on the merits. The Tokyo District Court enforced it. They said the elements for enforcement were present and they refused to allow the judgment debtor to escape. So we have a case in the Tokyo District Courts. We also have enforcement in China. The Nanjing Intermediate People's Court recognized a Singapore judgment and enforced it in December last year because we enforced one of their judgments earlier on. This case was put up as a reference case for all the Supreme People's Courts judges in a conference, the internal conference. A reference case means it's to be followed. Right? This is the name of the case, Colma Group. So, if you look back, the Korean judges have told us that in Korea, your own civil procedure code also allows enforcement of foreign judgments, on the money judgments, and again, very narrow grounds, fraud, no due process, reciprocity. So the Tokyo court enforced our judgments, even though there was no precedent of a Singapore court enforcing a Tokyo case. But they said they would have if there was such a case. So on that basis, satisfied. Reciprocity is satisfied, they enforced it. So you find that actually if you enforce a judgment whether in common law or civil law country, the ability of the judgment debtor to raise difficulties is much less than the New York Convention. Now, if that hasn't excited you yet, there's another matter that has come up which I think Many people do not know because it just happened. But you will be actually quite surprised to note that in May this year, an unprecedented step occurred. Chief Justices, presiding judges and senior judiciary from 21 countries and 29 courts met in London. And what did we do? We discussed international commercial court best practices. We discussed the problems uh, trading parties have with the differences. And we all resolved, can you imagine this, 21 countries. And they included countries like England, the Middle East, Africa, China, Singapore, Australia, Canada, and the US, two courts in the US. We all agree that we need to move towards first producing a multilateral memorandum of guidance explaining how judgments should be enforced in each other's country. So this is totally outside treaties. It is just court to court, non-binding agreements, but it gives confidence that we will enforce each other's judgments. We will establish a working party also. So, number one was to work towards the multilateral MOGs. Second, identify best practices for adoption in all our courts. Third, establish a structure where commercial judges from developing countries can be helped to increase their experience by sitting in our different, more developed courts. And practical issues such as liaison with other bodies, arbitral bodies. We want to discuss and identify what problems arbitral bodies have, what problems commercial courts have, and the interaction between the two. And I think the potential of this body called the 
standing international forum of commercial courts is enormous. It is like a whole new a convention on the side, where governments cannot slow it down. We will meet again in the New York in the autumn of 2018 next year. I'll be meeting your, some of your judges. I hope to persuade them to come to this conference because so far they are missing. China was there but they were not. So if I go to the Standing International Forum of Commercial Courts, let me show you who went. UK, they hosted Ireland, Netherlands, Germany, UAE, Bahrain, Qatar, Nigeria, Rwanda, Sierra Leone, Uganda, Kazakhstan, China. They sent the President and Chief Judge of the First Circuit. He's a Vice Minister rank. Singapore, Australia, the Federal Court, the Supreme Court of Victoria, Supreme Court of New South Wales, the Chief Justices were present. New Zealand, a senior judge was present. Canada, Ontario sent somebody. USA, Southern District Court of New York, and the Delaware Supreme Court. Bermuda, Cayman Islands, Eastern Caribbean. Look at that network. If we sign a multilateral MOG, our judgments will be enforced like the Hague Convention. So, this is the website where you can find information about our court. You can find out about rules, practice directions, filings. And uh, I have two things to tell you in conclusion. First, Singapore has set up the Asian Business Law Institute. We had our first conference on the conversion of Asian business law. Our first project, which should be completed by the end of this year, is Convergence in International Civil Procedure, the Harmonization and Recognition and Enforcement of Foreign Judgments. So there's an in-depth study on the enforcement of foreign judgments in all the Asian ASEAN countries and the partners are major trading partners, South Korea, Japan, India, China, Australia. That's the first stage. The second stage, which will take time, is to look into the harmonization of commercial laws. Secondly, Singapore also spearheaded a group of insolvency judges from Australia, Bermuda, BVI, Cayman Islands, Canada, England and Wales, U.S., two courts, Delaware, Southern District of New York, to sign a Judicial Insolvency Network Memorandum. This enables a bankruptcy judge in a cross-border insolvency to reach out to another bankruptcy judge in another of these jurisdictions so that the orders in a cross-border insolvency can be made compatible and consistent. It enables the two judges to even convene a hearing through video conferencing. And last week, there was a conference for insolvency practitioners. And one part of that conference was a mock hearing. A hypothetical was put up. There were two judges that dialed in, the Singapore insolvency judge, Justice Ramesh, and Justice Groper, the US bankruptcy judge, and they had two teams arguing, Kirkland and Ellis and Milbank Tweed in the US, and Ellen and Gladhill and Rajan Tan in Singapore. So that was the mock to show insolvency practitioners how this would work. And I think two of our judges, one of them was